It is my distinct privilege to welcome our President and Vice Chancellor, Professor Santa Ono, to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to University of British Columbia. Michaela and I are going to teach you something that hopefully you have already learned. We'll start on this side, and then we'll go there. No, we'll start here, and then there, and then there, and then with you guys, the largest group. How does this go? I think I say, UBC what? And you say? UBC O. Let's hear it louder. UBC what? That's pretty good. UBC what? UBC O. UBC what? UBC O. Are you ready to erupt? UBC what? UBC O. There you go. That's terrific. Should we do one with everybody here? One with everybody. Are you ready? UBC what? UBC O. That is the best. Thank you. Let's hear it from Michaela. Well, welcome everyone. We have been waiting with great anticipation for your arrival. Congratulations. The class of 2022 or the class of 2023, are you excited at being at university? You know, we're looking forward to interacting with you. I try to come here as often as I can and uh, I also try to connect with uh, students and faculty and staff here virtually. So if you are on social media, I don't know, probably you like Instagram better than Twitter or Facebook, but feel free to connect with me. My uh, Twitter and Instagram handle is at UBCPrez, P-R-E-Z. And um, I like to uh, keep connected and tell folks what's happening at uh, this great university. So I hope to be able to connect with you there. I'm looking at my new iPhone here and it, it doesn't recognize my face yet, so I have to keep turning it on every now and then. You are joining a university that you may or may not know this year was ranked by two of the world's most prestigious rankings as number 25 in the world by the NTU rankings and number 27 in the world by US News and World Report in the United States. Are you excited about that? One of the great universities in the world. And it is a reflection of all of your accomplishments that you have been accepted at such a globally renowned university that has graduated three prime ministers, including the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Eight Nobel Prize winners, 65 Olympic medalists, including three current students that have medals. Isn't that pretty impressive? 65 Olympic medalists. 71 Rhodes Scholars and 300 faculty members that are members of the world's most learned societies such as the Royal Society of Canada and the U.S. National Academies of Science. There is so much to be proud of. I hope your parents and your grandparents are proud of you. We are proud of everything that you have accomplished that has earned you a place at one of the world's top 25 universities. Now, if you look around you, there's something else that we're very proud of. That is the diversity of this institution. If you look around you, you probably noticed that people come from all over the world, from all across Canada, every single province and territory. And that is something which I think will enrich and strengthen your experience. There are students from 150 countries at this university as we speak today. And by the way, we are considered as Canada's most international university. Isn't that great? Let's hear it for our diversity. The fact that students come here from all over the world, I think, reflects the esteem in which this institution is held. And I truly believe that the diversity that is actually represented here is one of the greatest things that you can take away with you after you are finished with your education, regardless of what faculty or school you are in. But to really capitalize on that diversity, it's really important that you do something active. And that is that you embrace fully inclusivity. That you take the difficult step to reach out to someone that looks different from you, that may be from a different corner of the globe, and you make the effort, even if it's difficult, to try to understand their perspective. It will broaden your horizons. It will make you a better global citizen. 
It is something that also requires that you embrace this community where respect for each other, for different points of view, is at the core of everything that we do. You see, although it might be hard when somebody has a different point of view, it is at the cornerstone of something that we call academic freedom. And you will broaden your horizons and you will understand other people better if you try to put yourselves in their shoes and try to understand their perspective. The world needs more global citizens. Now you heard our motto, 2MS, and you heard about one of the definitions of 2MS, and that is, it is yours. This university, the outstanding faculty, the facilities, it's all yours. But there's a second meaning of 2MS that I want you to focus on today. And that is a different interpretation, which is it's up to you. And what we mean by that is it's, it's up to you what you do with this education. On one, of, one of the world's great universities. Let's focus on that second meeting. It's up to you. You know, I think it's something that you should do every time you wake up. You know, when you're there, even if you haven't slept out long, when you're in front of the mirror, and ask that question. It's up to you. And you can ask yourself, it's up to me what I do with the education that I receive at UBC. Now, I hope the answer resonates with the vision of this institution. We actually just had our strategic plan for the university endorsed by the Board of Governors and the Senate to the university. And it's called Shaping Our Next Century because we're entering our second century as a university. What we're really focused on in that vision is Everything that we do as a university in the classroom, everything that you do in your extracurricular activities, we hope that it will inspire you and others to make the world a better place. It's a very high bar that we've set for the faculty, students, and staff of, a, of this institution. But it's a bar, it's a vision that came from the students and the faculty and the staff and alumni of this institution. It's a bar that you've set for yourself. And when we shifted, sifted through the 35,000 applications for admission to this institution in broad-based admissions, we looked for evidence that you would be the kind of person that wouldn't be just coming to this university for a piece of paper, for a diploma, for a credential. We looked for evidence that you had this fire inside you to make of your life some, something which would leave the world a better place, consistent with the vision of this institution. Now, I want to tell you about, um, I could tell you about hundreds, if not thousands, of people who've gone before you. And I've met students that have graduated from this campus, that have worked for the prime minister, who have worked for justices, who have graced the stages of theater and music around the world. There are thousands of examples in this very young campus of students that have preceded you that are changing the world and making the world a better place. But today I want to focus on something a little bit different. I want to talk about women. I want to talk about women, two women in particular. Because you see, I'm going to be turning 56 years old this year, It's pretty ancient from your perspective. But the world has changed enormously since I was in your shoes in 1980 when I entered the university. I want to tell you about two people. One of them is Bertha Wilson, and the other is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or RBG, as they say. Some of you may know who these two are, and some of you may not. But I hope after today that you will know who they are and why I hope they inspire you during your time here at UBC. These are two women that profoundly changed the world because of their work, because of their passion, because of their courage and their bravery. Both of them served in the Supreme Court of Canada in the case of Bertha Wilson in the United States, in the case of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She still serves at the age of 83. These are amazing people, because in 1980, when I was going to university like you, 
many universities were just starting to admit women. There are a lot of women in this class. Isn't that great? How about you girls? Isn't it great there are a lot of women in this class? And it's not just around the world. If you actually look and look at the composites on the Vancouver campus, there are a lot of faculties that are almost primarily men. How this university has changed in just 40 years or so. Now, these two pioneers should inspire you for a number of reasons. They made the world better because they led the way when there was no role model before them. And they were great university students, and they applied to different law schools. And do you know what the deans of the law schools said? We have a bunch of deans here. They asked the question, they had the audacity to ask the question to these students that were the, among the top in their class after their undergraduate years. Tell us why we should give away a place to a deserving young man for you in the 70s and 80s. That's the way things were in North America, in Canada, and the United States. Isn't it great how much the world has changed? And even after they graduated from Columbia University and the great universities of Canada, women had a hard time getting a job. In the case of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was the, one of the top five law students at Harvard Law and Columbia Law. And despite the fact that there are 57,000 lawyers in Manhattan, she couldn't get one job offer, being one of the best in one of the most elite set of law schools in the world. But let me tell you a little bit about Bertha Wilson. Like some of you, international students, she was an international student. She immigrated to Canada from Scotland, came far away to Canada. She was the first woman appointed to the Court of Appeals for Ontario in 1975. And in 1982, right when I was in the middle of my university education, pretty recent history, at least from my perspective, she became the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada on the advice of the then Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. It took until 1982 for the first woman to be appointed to the highest court in Canada. When she retired in 1991, she was made a companion of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada that same year, one of the very few lawyers to be both recognized as a scholar and as a leader of this nation. Now, why should she inspire you? Why should they inspire you? Well, they had the bravery and courage to articulate something very, very basic that has paved the way for more women at UBC than men, from recent history being where there were more men than women. She articulated the idea that women should have a say in legal decisions and resolutions, and that their experience was just as important as the experience of men in deciding the laws of the land. We take it for granted today. Not that long ago, it was primarily a male-dominated view that shaped the laws of this land. It was no different in the US, and it was no different. It still is like that in many parts of the world. She had the courage to say that reproductive rights are issues of personal decision and conscience. That the female's body is her own. And that that perspective should be central to a woman's identity and to her citizenship in Canada. Think back to the time that she became a justice of the Supreme Court. This was in a landscape that under the law, women were still viewed as subordinate to men. In the 80s, at that time, 
in terms of finance, men made much more money than women. And unfortunately, it's still the case in certain sectors of our economy. In terms of credit history, even if you were a hardworking woman who paid their bills on time, when it came to financial institutions, your credit history rested upon your husband, not upon your industry and dependability. And in cases of sexual or physical, physical abuse, women were not treated as equals to men. It's because of her that the landscape has changed. Well, let me very, be very clear. There is no place at this university for sexual assault to anyone. If you don't embrace a culture of consent and don't respect your fellow students, this is the wrong university for you. Don't you agree? There are other things that uh, Bertha did. You know, back then in the 80s, it wasn't clear who had to hold the gold standard for protection of the liberties and rights of men and women. She said it should be given that the power and in institutions that shape individual opportunities and liberties, that all of those institutions, public and private, should protect and ensure liberty as much, if not more, than it might threaten it. And it was because of her that she articulated that universities should also be held accountable for protecting equal opportunities for men and women. She had that role, Bertha Wilson. She personified in her life that women could achieve anything in the legal profession but her impact went well, well beyond the legal profession. It was because of her example that in, in sector, in profession, in all professions that you can imagine, that the landscape changed, that pay equity became a given, that equal opportunity became a given, and that women and men were accepted into universities on equal standards and an equal playing field. So this is what I want to leave with you. The newest members of this great university that has changed, thank goodness, so that men and women are treated the same. When you think about our motto, to a mest, ask yourself, when you look in the mirror, it's up to you, the motto says. Look in the mirror, periodically in the morning, and ask yourself, it's up to me. How will I change the world to be a better place? You've just heard about two women that have completely changed the landscape of North America. How will you, through your actions, large and small, make an impact? How will you be like Bertha Wilson? You see, beyond what each of you accomplishes individually, beyond what you create for yourself this day forward. Imagine a day. Imagine the impact that each of you, together, collectively, the impact that you can make on making Canada and the world a better place. Now, some of you may be scared, but I ask you to remember something. If you remember the first time you rode your bike, when your mom or dad or uncle or aunt or grandparents were there with you holding onto that seat as they were taking off the training wheels and you were about to ride a bike for the, for the first time, remember that? You probably felt scared. Or remember the time that you were about to dive off the high platform into a pool and that water looked pretty hard from way up there? You were probably scared. And some of you may feel that way today. That's the way I felt when I entered university. But there's one thing to remember. Look back to all those difficult moments. Being scared simply means that you're about to do something very brave. And don't forget 
that all 16,000 faculty and staff, all 325,000 living alumni of this university are rooting for you every step of the way. We have absolute confidence in you. Congratulations and welcome to the University of British Columbia.